Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. We'll not waste any time building up what's going to come next in this video. It's what the title says, the ultimate list of all kaiju in the MonsterVerse. We've covered the creatures that have appeared in various movies, shows, comics, games, and every other source. So, without further ado, let's get this wild ride started. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. King Kong. In Kong, Skull Island, we see a young Kong who's pretty territorial and defensive, guarding Skull Island like a bus. He's tough against threats, especially those ugly and vile skull crawlers. That doesn't take too kindly to the 1973 Monarch Expedition Team. Despite being a young member of his race, Kong's a beast in a fight, easily crushing most island predators. But hey, aggression isn't really his favorite hobby. He's got a soft spot, particularly feeling lonely and craving social interaction. When Mason Weaver touches his face, Kong gets all emotional and teary-eyed. He even risks his life to save Weaver and her crew from the Skull Devil. In the graphic novel Kingdom Kong, Kong has mellowed out a bit, with humans still rocking his guardian role. He tries saving a scared buffalo from psycho vultures, getting real sad when he fails. In Godzilla vs. Kong, Kong's all grown up and way cooler with humans. He's got a special bond with Jia, a young iwi girl who secretly teaches him sign language. But even with this friendship, Kong's still feeling the blues, especially when he's taken off Skull Island. In the Hollow Earth, he's driven by the hope of finding more of his kind. And when he squares off with Godzilla in Hong Kong, Kong's pride doesn't let him back down, even in defeat. Post-fight, he helps Godzilla take down Mechagodzilla and ends up in a sort of truce with Godzilla. While the giant lizard becomes the king of the surface world, Kong becomes the de facto king of Hollow Earth. Kong still knows how to hold his own against other alpha titans, not giving in to their authority, be it Ghidorah or Godzilla. I mean, that was the reason he didn't answer Ghidorah's call in Godzilla, King of Monsters, a feat that only a few like Godzilla and Mothra could achieve. Now, in the new empire, his bastion at Hollow Earth is going to be challenged by its incumbent ruler, the Scar King. And since Kong is presumably not strong enough to take on the orangutan-based titan, he's going to seek out his new buddy Godzilla for help, thereby setting some god-level friendship goals. Godzilla. In Godzilla, our big guy makes it his life's purpose to keep Earth's balance from getting wrecked. He's territorial, but not in a petty way. And, well, no king who was petty was ever a king. He doesn't mess with ships unless they're in his way, often diving under them, even ignoring military attacks while on his Muto hunting mission. Godzilla's not really anti-human, he just finds us too small to bother with. When he accidentally wrecked the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm pretty sure he wanted to sort of apologize, but too bad we puny humans don't speak Godzilla. As far as his style is concerned, he's He's kinda like a last samurai, a lone warrior forced into action when needed. His relationships with other titans are interesting. He became a BFF with Mothra, helping each other out against Ghidorah and Rodan. When Mothra sacrifices herself, Godzilla was visibly moved, absorbing her energy to go all thermonuclear on Ghidorah, thereby avenging his fallen friend. With the Mutos, it's, uh, it's complicated. He sees them as pests, but spares the Queen Muto when she accepts him as the Alpha. His fights with Ghidorah are like good versus evil, but with Kong, it's an old species grudge. But they do become frenemies later on. They end up teaming against Mechagodzilla, showing they can bury the hatchet when needed. As the Alpha, Godzilla doesn't bully the other Titans who used to follow Ghidorah. Instead, he keeps them in line, preventing chaos and looking out for human settlements too. So, a big G has got some class. King Ghidorah. Ghidorah, Godzilla's arch nemesis, was chilling, literally, in an Antarctic glacier, until eco-terrorists led by Emma Russell and Alan Jonah woke him up in 2019. They thought they could use him to reboot Earth's ecosystem, not realizing Ghidorah's an alien with zero chills in a manner of speaking for Earth's natural order. Ghidorah quickly overthrows Godzilla as the top dog, waking up other titans to wreak global havoc. It took a tag-team effort from Godzilla, Mothra, the military, Monarch, and the Russells to finally take him down. This guy's bad news. Unlike other Titans who might squash humans by accident or out of hunger, Ghidorah's got a mean streak. He blasts humans with his gravity beams just for kicks and seems to enjoy it. Ghidorah's got a serious rivalry with Godzilla. When they first face off post-awakening, they treat each other as two alphas sizing the other guy up. Each one of its heads has got its own vibe going on. The middle head, also called Ichi, is the brainiac and the cruel one, always leading the charge and getting a kick out of the mayhem. The right head, or knee, is the hothead, always ready for a fight and quick to join in on the destruction. It follows Ichi's 
lead but has its own aggressive flair. Then there's the left head, San, aka Kevin, the oddball of the trio. Kevin's more curious and easily distracted, often needing a nudge from Ichi to stay on task. So yeah, they have their own personalities, but together, oh man, together, they're a relentless force. Ghidorah's obsession with destruction is almost single-minded, a scene when he resumes to a scene when he resumes toying with humans in an osprey after a brief distraction. But this fixation can also be his downfall, like when the Russells use the Yorka to lure him away from Godzilla, giving Big G time to recover and fight back. Mothra, Mothra, created by a legendary for the MonsterVerse, feels like a throwback to her mystical Toho roots. She's like a phoenix, hatching anew from an egg whenever she dies. Mothra are tough, having evolved in a rough prehistoric world full of giant and powerful predators. She's got a stinger and sharp legs for defense. Her bond with Godzilla goes way back. They've been allies for ages, even teaming up in an ancient war against one of Kong's ancestors and a skull crawler. Way back, like uh, 10,000 years ago, Mothra was a big deal in Yunnan province and was even worshipped as a deity. Her worshippers protected her egg, and she, in return, kept predatory titans at bay. Her last, pre-21st century egg sat untouched in a temple, surrounded by jungle ruins for several millennia. Smart and loyal, Mothra doesn't play the flip-flop game. When Ghidorah dethrones Godzilla, she sticks with her old pal, even risking her own life to find and help him. Her sacrifice lets Godzilla take down Ghidorah. She's even smart enough to lead humans to Godzilla's resting place, showing she gets the whole teamwork thing. You could say that she's the gentle giant among titans. She's curious, but chill with humans, like when she met monarch personnel. She only got defensive when they tried to contain her. Even then, she wasn't out for blood. Mothra's like the peacekeeper, taking down foes like Rodan without going for the kill. In a world of monster mayhem, she's more about life and protection than destruction. In fact, in several comics, including World War Kaiju, she played the role of a peacekeeper. We recently explored this comic, so uh, you might want to check it out. Destoroyah. Destoroyah's origin starts with a bunch of ancient microscopic crustaceans chilling under Tokyo Bay. These little guys, from the Precambrian era, loved their anaerobic lifestyle until Dr. Serizawa shook things up in 1954. His oxygen destroyer not only took out the first Godzilla, but also woke these crustaceans up. The weapon's aftermath mutated them, and over 40 years, they evolved, tapping into micro-oxygen for the biological needs. Tokyo Bay Aqualine's construction further stirred them up, which led them to the surface, where they began feasting and merging into to bigger, badder forms. Destoroyah is a patchwork monster, a bit like Hedorah, made up of trillions of these tiny critters. Initially, they were like minuscule horseshoe crabs. These trillions of organisms later banded together, forming man-sized crustacean monsters known as Destoroyah's juvenile forms. Faced with the Japanese self-defense force, these juveniles merge into a massive aggregate form and then evolve into a winged flying form. Destoroyah, now able to switch between flying and aggregate forms, took on Godzilla Jr. After a brief defeat by Jr., Destoroyah hit its final form, the perfect form, and try to swarm Godzilla by splitting back into the aggregate forms. Killing Destoroyah isn't straightforward. If you take down its big form without letting it split and recombine, all the little guys inside go down too. Godzilla learned this the hard way, attacking Destoroyah's chest, forcing it to split and then reform to recover. Destoroyah's not your average monster. He's up there with the worst of Godzilla's enemies, like King Ghidorah and Space Godzilla. This guy knows exactly what destruction he's causing and seems to love it. He's particularly ruthless, attacking Godzilla Jr. just for kicks and then later finishing him off. Apart from physical attacks, he messes with Godzilla emotionally too, exploiting his bond with his son. Rodan. The monsterverse Rodan is like a prehistoric flying reptile, but not exactly a textbook pterosaur. He's got some bird of prey vibes going around with a beak built for tearing and talons for grabbing, much like eagles and hooks. His head has a pair of backward growing bony horns and his wings that double his forelimbs. These can fold up when he's not doing something like trying to kill Godzilla. Rodan's so impressive that he might have inspired the Navajo legend of, say, Nina Halei, the rock monster eagle. Rodan hatched at Isla de Moraz volcano in Mexico, where his parents once nested. He turned the volcano, no locally as El Nido del Demonio, or the Demon's Nest, into his home and nap spot for a few hundred years. Over time, he developed a rock-like skin and other biovolcanic traits to adapt to his fiery home. Rodan's basically a flying furnace. He's got an internal volcanic combustion system that heats him up to a scorching 1200 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough to roast anything nearby, as Mothra found out the hard way during their clash. Even a stab wound on Rodan looks like a mini-volcanic eruption. When Rodan takes flight, his massive wings stir up a sonic boom that's strong enough to wreck 
buildings and toss cars, debris, and even people around like they're in a tornado. As for heat resistance, there's hardly anyone who could beat Rodan. He could technically swim in magma, thanks to his internal biovolcanic system. Director Michael Doherty even suggests this could be a travel method for him. Design-wise, Rodan's got a bit of smog from the Hobbit movies in him, with his fiery colors and glowing cracks. He also shares some traits with Disney's Firebird from Fantasia 2000. It's time to show the world what you can do. Mechagodzilla. Apex Cybernetics built Mechagodzilla to outdo the Titans and recrown humanity as the top dog. Their big ups, though, was using Ghidorah's telepathic skull in its control system. This backfired big time, letting Ghidorah's ghost in the machine hijack Mechagodzilla with pilot Ren Serizawa losing control. This metal monster went berserk in Hong Kong, only stopping when Godzilla and Kong teamed up to tear it apart, Kong's axe doing the final honors. Initially, Mechagodzilla was just a super fancy robot, puppeteered by Serizawa through a mind link. But once Ghidorah's spirit took over, it became a self-thinking, rampaging nightmare, showing the same brutal and bloodthirsty traits as Ghidorah. This new consciousness was a twisted blend of Ghidorah's malice and the Mecha's AI. Is this one of those moments where movies predict the future? <laughs> Food for thought. I guess. The first thing this rogue mecha does is crushing its creator, Walter Simmons. Then it unleashes its proton scream on Hong Kong's people and buildings. Its main mission was to wipe out Godzilla, but it didn't mind going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kong, especially when Kong started chopping with his ancestral axe. Mecha Godzilla's focus shifted to annihilating Kong, showing just how adaptable and ruthless it was. Unlike Ghidorah's left head, from which its mind originated, Mecha Godzilla lacked any quirks or hesitations. It was all business, not showing Ghidorah's fear or curiosity toward humans. It knew its arsenal and used it with deadly precision, not even flinching when it was being dismantled limb by limb by Kong. And just like Ghidorah, Mechagodzilla made a sound that seemed a lot like laughing while wrecking the city with its proton scream. Scar King. In the latest trailer of Godzilla x Kong, the new empire, we're introduced to a new heavyweight, the Scar King. This guy's ruling Hollow Earth like he owns the place, and he's so tough that Kong has to call in Godzilla for backup. He's a giant orangutan-like titan with long arms, thick reddish fur, and eyes glowing a spooky blue. He's even got some bright red war paint to add a dash of menace to his overall persona. Monsterverse boss might recall whispers about the Scar King from past movies and series like Unnatural World. He's not new to the game. He's been using Hollow Earth's energy to copy his rival's powers. Godzilla once trapped him down there, but now he's back and ready to rumble as the new trailer and poster tease. The Scar King might also be the big boss of the Kongs in Hollow Earth, having toppled them to grab power. In fact, the Scar King's size and strength are on full display in the trailer, and he's presumably commanding an army of Kongs. The trailer shows him lounging on a throne. Furthermore, he seems to hold some serious grudge against humans. Humans live in Hollow Earth, probably Iwi folks from Skull Island. This ramps up the tension, so the new movie would be way more than just a titan tussle. Maybe Kong will flip the scripts and rally these Kongs working for the Scar King to show off who's really in charge, sort of like a guerrilla showdown in the wild. The Scar King isn't from Toho's lineup, so details are sketchy, but what's clear is he's a force to be reckoned with in the Monsterverse. Behemoth. In Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Behemoth, aka Titanus Behemoth, or the Mapinguari to locals, was in Monarch Outpost 58, tucked away in a Rio de Janeiro cavern. Mark Russell had a peek at his file. When Ghidorah, the new Alpha, let out his call, Behemoth woke up and joined the Titan pack except for Godzilla, Mothra, and Kong on a rampage. In Rio, Behemoth went full bull in a china shop with his massive tusks, bulldozing buildings. Then Madison Russell fired up an orca in Boston, and Behemoth lumbered over. He was too slow to catch the final showdown, but arrived just in time to see Godzilla finish off Ghidorah. Though initially confrontational, Behemoth quickly joined Rodan and others in acknowledging Godzilla as the new boss. Later on, news hit that Behemoth was actually doing Mother Nature a solid. His droppings turned out to be a top-notch fertilizer, especially for the Amazon's deforested areas. Design-wise, Behemoth's a blend of prehistoric heavyweights like the woolly mammoth's tusks and the giant ground sloth. He knuckle-walks like a gorilla, covered in brown fur with a mammoth-style head, small ears and a short trunk. His back's decked out with serrated granite spines mixed with metal and ore. His front limbs end in huge claws like an anteater, but his back legs are built sturdier for support. And adding a touch of green, his tusks and fur have algae or vines growing on them, kind of like a tree sloth.
Methuselah. Methuselah's got a legendary rap sheet. Way back in time, he wiped out a village in Munich, then decided to nap on the ruins, which is, uh, kinda dark. Over time, a forest sprouted on him, and folks mistook him for a mountain, until Monarch figured out that he wasn't part of the scenery. Hanging out in Monarch Outpost 67 in Munich, this titan goes by Titanus Methuselah. We don't get a full look at Methuselah in the films, but he's a four-legged giant with a reptilian face and bull-like horns. His eyes are glossy and kinda foggy, lacking clear pupils. The unique thing about him is that Methuselah's got this massive mountain on his back, making him blend in as part of Germany's landscape. He's been known to disguise himself as an island and even an iceberg. As far as its personality is concerned, Monarch labels Methuselah as a protector, like Godzilla, Mothra, Kong, and Behemoth. He's been known to shield humans from disasters and titan attacks, even giving them a lift when needed. Leaf Wings. Leaf Wings a less feisty cousin of the Psycho Vultures, a Skull Island's resident flying critters, often seen fluttering around in big groups. They've had a couple of run-ins with humans, first during the 1973 Monarch Expedition, and then again in a hush-hush 1995 trip. In 2019, a bunch of them left Skull Island to join King Ghidorah's monster rally in Boston, but they showed up just in time to see Godzilla take him down. Fast forward to 2024, and they're still hanging out in the massive dome over Skull Island, which keeps the island's climate just right for them. They even made a home in the sprawling underground world of the Hollow Earth, spotted by the Monarch Apex Cybernetics crew. Looks-wise, Leaf Wings are a blend of bats and pterosaurs, sporting spiky rostrums on the foreheads. Their wings are a leafy green, making them masters of disguise among the trees when they're chilling in groups. The Kong Skull Island versions had this cool yellow pattern on their heads and backs, while in Skull Island, the birth of Kong, they rock green, leaf-like wings with brown bodies. In Godzilla vs. Kong, some were spotted with red and green patterns. Even though they're not as mean as psycho vultures, you wouldn't want to mess with Leaf Wings. They're omnivorous with a side of photosynthesis, spending the days flying high above Skull Island looking for snacks. Come nightfall, they cozy up together in the island's jungle highlands. Biolante. Biolante started as a giant rose with a mini jaw set inside a big red flower and loads of grabby vines. She's got leaves drooping from her neck, but she's pretty much stuck to the ground, moving only by turning into a cloud of orange-yellow spores. Her base has this glowing yellowish-red sac, the nucleus, that's kind of a mystery but seems to be an energy source. Then Biolante goes full beast mode. Thanks to her Godzilla DNA, she morphs into a horror show with a croc-like head, a mouth full of sharp teeth, and six big tusks. Vines and tendrils are her thing in both forms some ending in spears, others in mini toothy mouths. In beast mode, she uses her main tendrils to lunge and chase, showing off this meaty, brain-like flesh on her chest. As far as its personality is concerned, she's got the consciousness of Erika Shirigami, Genichiro Shirigami's late daughter, mixed into her. Psychic Miki Segusa says Biolante, especially when first rooted in Lake Ashi, was scared and crying out. Godzilla heard these calls too. Over time, Erika's consciousness got overshadowed by Biolante's Godzilla side, turning her more into a raging monster. Biolante can bust into golden particles, shoot up into the sky, and come back all healed up. In a final showdown, this lets her survive her clash with Godzilla. Plus, in her plant beast form, she spits out loads of radioactive sap from her mega mouth, cranking up Godzilla's body temperature and activating the anti-nuclear energy bacteria that knocked him out of the fight. Space Godzilla. In Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, there's this wild theory about Godzilla cells hitching a cosmic ride into a black hole and coming out of a white hole, all mutated. They think these cells either hitched a lift with Biolante into space or tagged along on Mothra's wings. Space Godzilla's got that Godzilla look but with a navy blue and dark reddish purple skin vibe. He's a chunkier and taller version of Godzilla, sporting massive white crystal shoulders and a spiky crystal tail. His back is decked out in white crystal fins too. The guy's so bulky he can't walk well or run, but he makes up for it with flying skills. His arms are kind of wimpy and short, but he's big on using his mind powers over brute strength. His elongated head, sharp teeth, and tusk-lined mouth give him a Biolante-esque look, and he's got these fiery orange eyes topped with a yellow to orange crest. Furthermore, Space Godzilla's a smart cookie, one of Godzilla's brainiest enemies. He's adept at strategy, and can often be seen siphoning power and setting traps. Because of his bulky build, Space Godzilla prefers long-range attacks and uses his Corona Beam to do so. His short arms are pretty useless in a scrap, but does make good use of his tail when things get up close and personal.
Skull crawlers. Skull crawlers are freaky amphibian critters from Skull Island. They're massive two-armed beasts with a serpentine tail and a body that's all muscle and sinew. Known for their spooky skeletal look, especially around their torso and skull-like heads, their eye sockets are just decoys. The real eyes are tucked away behind, safe from attackers. These creatures have horizontal pupils, kinda frog-like, and their skin ranges from dark brown to green, even bone white in some. Plus, their skin's kinda see-through, showing off their ribs. These underground hunters are always on the prowl, driven by crazy high metallic. They're so ravenous they'll even eat each other after mating. Aggressive and clever, the skull crawlers are tough customers. One even dodged a grenade trick by refusing to eat a baited soldier, just swatting him aside. The young ones are fearless and reckless, brazenly taking on Kong despite being outclassed and overpowered. One skull crawler, known as the Skull Devil, seemed smarter than the rest. It made its move when Kong was down, showing a bit of strategic thinking. It's got a particular taste for humans, often ditching Kong to chase after James Conrad and Mason Weaver. Warbats. Warbats are these massive serpentine reptiles, but are a bit of a mystery, much like all titans. They seem to have evolved in the hollow earth, getting huge thanks to the energy-rich subterranean ecosystem down there. These creatures are a blend of snake and dragon, sporting a greyish body with two red wing-like membranes running along their upper half. These wings are held up by long spines, which are actually part of their ribcage. With a long snake-like torso, they're built for slinking around hollow earth's tricky landscape, and they've got ventral scales on their underside, which pronounces their snake vibes. The warbats its heads are massive and snake-like, complete with two giant 14-foot fangs jutting from their lower jaw, plus a bunch of needly teeth. Their eyes are green and cat-like, with horizontal pupils, and they've got crocodile-style bony ridges over their eyes. Oh, and their blood is light green. These guys are top-tier predators in the Hollow Earth's rainforests, aggressive and adept at squeezing the life out of their prey, just like constrictor snakes. They hunt in pairs, working together like they did when they ambushed Kong in Godzilla vs. Kong. Angiris. Angiris from Godzilla Raids Again is like an ancient Ankylosaurus, living alongside Godzilla back in the Cretaceous, around 150 to 70 million years ago. This tough titan survived into modern times by taking a long nap until the 1950s nuclear bomb tests woke him up. According to the official word, he's mostly been in Serbia. Design-wise, Angiris is a mashup of an Ankylosaurus, armadillo, hedgehog, and crocodile. He's got this stout, armored body, complete with a bunch of curvy horns on his head and a single horn on his snout. His face is long and crooked rock-like, sporting two big tusks up front, followed by a bunch of smaller, jagged teeth. His back is filled with spikes and sharp edges, which serves as a defensive as well as offensive tool. And his tail is longer than his body, spiky and pretty much his unique feature. Though his back legs are longer, letting him stand tall, he mostly walks on all fours. In the ring, Angiris is a scrappy fighter, though. He's always up for a brawl, even against bigger bad guys. But there's more to him than just fangs and fury. He's a BFF to Godzilla, like a genuine buddy. Unlike other Godzilla allies who team up out of need, Angiris and Godzilla have a real bromance. <laughs> it's cute. This was super clear in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, where Angiris could tell fake Godzilla wasn't his pal and jumped into the fray. Muto, female, male. The Muto, or massive unidentified terrestrial organisms, have an iridescent metallic greyish black exoskeleton. They've got flat, stretched out heads with red visor like eyes and a set of dagger like teeth, supported by a hook beak like structure. Their hind legs are long and slender and end in two hoof like toes. A real bizarre get up. The male Muto's got a slimmer airborne build, quite the contrast to the beefier female. Speaking of differences, the females are enormous, towering almost as tall as Godzilla, with a pair of clawed forelimbs and extra manipulators on the abdomen. They're a six-legged nightmare and have this pouch on the lower abdomen where they keep their glowing eggs when pregnant. The Mutos are pretty straightforward, munch on radiation and make more Mutos. They're smart, but not exactly deep thinkers. These creatures don't really care about humans or our stuff. Godzilla might try to dodge big structures, but Mutos, hmm, they bulldoze through everything. They do, however, use their EMP blast strategically, like when the male took out some fighter jets. When it's time for romance, the male Muto offers a nuclear warhead as a love token. <laughs> they even have a sort of tender moment moment, pressing heads together before setting up their nest in San Francisco. The male plays guard while the female gets busy with egg laying, but they both don't mind throwing down with Godzilla when needed. The male Muto, with his sleeker build and wings, prefers hit and run tactics in a fight. When their nest gets wrecked, the female's maternal instincts kick in big time. She races to the site, digging frantically for any surviving eggs and goes full on berserk when she finds none left. The male, meanwhile, is a bit slower on the uptake but quickly joins the frantic search. 
Frostbark, Monarch Legacy of Monsters. In 2015, Lee Shaw's crew in Alaska had a run-in with a Frostbark while looking for Hiroshi Randa. Duho, their pilot, tried to take it on with his plane, but the Frostbark proved to be more than a match. It trashed the plane with its claws and then froze Duho solid. After crushing the wrecked plane, it turned its frosty attention to Kate Randa, Kentaro Randa, Lee, and Mary Holloway Hewitt. Kentaro managed a temporary distraction with a flare gun, but the Frostbark quickly got back on their trail. Luckily, the humans hid in a glacial tunnel, and the creature eventually lost interest and left. That night, the Frostbark sniffed out their campfire, burst through the ground, and gobbled up the flames. Quick thinking Lee used Duho's frozen body in the plane's aviation fuel to create a fiery distraction, which allowed them to make a getaway to a monarch chopper. The Frostbark chased the flames, but eventually stopped when the helicopter was out of reach. This creature is a four-legged behemoth, covered in sharp, angular armor plates with thick hair filling the gaps. It's got big, mole-like claws and sensory tendrils with glowing blue tips on its snout. Its mouth is full of jagged teeth, and its eyes are set way back on its head, almost hidden under its armored plates. The Frostbark's known for its deep, rumbling roars and isn't exactly friendly. It's super aggressive and attacks anything warm on the surface from its hiding spot under the snow. It's drawn to heat, so fire can easily distract it while it's hunting. Mother Longlegs. The Mother Longlegs is a one-of-a-kind giant spider, a breed that's quite different from any earthly arachnid. These ladies reproduce without any need for a mate. They've set up shop in the dense bamboo forest on the north side of the Skull Island, where their long spindly legs blend seamlessly with the bamboo, stand still in their territory, and you might mistake them for part of the forest until it's too late. Theory has it that these creatures might be a supercharged version of what we call Harvest Men or Daddy Longlegs. What's wild is that their legs contain bits of woody xylem, like they've absorbed the bamboo from their home right into their DNA. Evolution turned the mother long legs into walking death traps. They have eight blade-like legs raining down from above, each with a poison tip that not only pins down but also paralyzes their prey, draining the life out like a spider slurping a milkshake. Like many spiders, these creatures are drinkers, not eaters. Once they've got their prey, muscular tendrils from their underbelly wrap around the victim, hoisting them up into the air and straight into the spider's stomach. It's a nightmare buffet up in those bamboo forests. Scare Buffalo The Scare Buffalo, a creature with a splash of Asian water buffalo DNA, has made lakes and big rivers of Skull Island its home. What makes this beast unique is its back and flanks, which are a mix of tough bony structures and dense greenery. Furthermore, it's got an extremely powerful special four-chambered heart doing double duty. Two chambers pump blood while the other two circulate oxygen-rich chlorophyll to keep its body-grown plant life thriving. These guys have mastered the art of staying underwater for days, with just their island-like backs peeking out. I suppose it's the ultimate hide-and-seek move. Despite the old saying, this creature is pretty much a walking, breathing island. The scare buffalo can pack a punch when cornered. It's got these massive horns fused right to its skull, making a sort of bone shield. When this big guy charges, those horns mean business. Hollow Earth Lizard, aka Doug. Hailing from the depths of the Hollow Earth, these lizards are something out of a dino fan's dream. Their origins are a bit of a puzzle, but they've likely been thriving down there, beefed up by that unique Hollow Earth energy. Some folks even think they're distant cousins of Godzilla, what with their jagged dorsal plates and all. These big reptiles sport a slick greyish black skin, like the wearing armor made of spikes and osteoderms. Handy for warding off other Hollow Earth tough guys. They've got chunky heads with jaws packed full of gnarly teeth, and eyes that stare straight ahead. Predator to style. Dogs are quite the sneaky types, masters of the ambush. They blend right in with the rocky landscape, waiting to pounce on any poor creature that stumbles into their turf. When Kong kicked up a fuss with some mantle claws, these lizards were right there, ready to capitalize on the chaos. They can often be seen hanging out in groups. Maybe they're chit-chatting about lizard stuff or teaming up for a big hunt. Either way, they're, uh, they're not your average solitary predators. Hellhawk. Hellhawks. These gnarly creatures from the Hollow Earth are like the offspring of giant bats and giant vultures. Their vulture heads come with wickedly curved beaks, atop bodies with bat-like wings. These wings are all leathery, supported by bone fingers with a little thumb sticking out. But don't expect a feathery display. These guys are more about the rugged, leathery look, with just a smattering of thin, hair-like feathers on their noggins and backs. When they're not swooping around, they go full bird mode, standing on their talons and folding their wings neatly. But on the move, they're like creepy crawlies using those wings like forelimbs to scuttle around. Of course, they're not the singing type, more into ear-piercing screeches and some deep parrot-like chatter when they're trying to snatch human prey from each other's mouths. As far as its personality is concerned, well, let's just say they're not the friendliest. Aggressive hunters, <laughs> they love a good swarm and attack. 
Dragon Titan, Ion Dragon. In 1952, Keiko and William Randa stumbled upon the USS Lawton, weirdly parked in a Filipino jungle. Inside, they found the crew's bodies, eerily preserved in a gooey nacre. It's not before long that they're ambushed by the Ion Dragon, the ship's new squatter. This beast tore through the ship's metal like it was paper, nearly trapping the duo. They narrowly escaped, thanks to Lee Shaw, but not before the Ion Dragon made a last-ditch effort to snatch them. It then reclaimed its perch on the Lawton wreck, letting out a bone-chilling roar. The Ion Dragon is huge and made for the skies. It's got this dark, melanistic look and massive wings like a bat, with some flying fish fin vibes. It's sporting a pair of horns that could belong on a bull, and a freaky mouth. Think anglerfish meets bird, complete with a split beak and needly teeth. It's got gill-like things on its neck, digiti-grade legs with a three-toed talon, and a shark finesque spike duo on its back. Its tail is long, saurian, and ends in elegant, curvy spikes. This creature's big and scary appearance is matched with a shrill roar. Interestingly, the Ion Dragon secretes this naked stuff that perfectly mummifies its prey, keeping them fresh for years. Executive producer Matt Shackman hints that this could be for some life cycle step, or maybe it's just saving snacks for later. Orga. Orga's story starts with the Millennians, spacefaring aliens who crash landed on Earth and got stuck under the ocean. They turned themselves into biomass and hit the snooze button for 60 million years. A submarine's lights woke them up and the UFO went hunting for DNA to help them get comfy on Earth. When they found Godzilla, they hit the jackpot because of his organizer G1 cells, supercharging his durability. The Millennians nabbed Godzilla's DNA, mushed themselves into one body, and lo and behold, Orga was born. But Godzilla's DNA was too wild for them and they ended up with a Godzilla a look-alike that's all kinds of warped and lumpy. Orga's got this massive back, tiny head, big old hands with three fingers, tiny legs, and a short tail. His body's all asymmetrical, with rough, bumpy skin. In the fighting department, Orga's pretty basic. He only really managed to hit Godzilla once, spending most of the fight dodging Godzilla's blows and trying to line up his shoulder cannon. This got him in trouble when he tried to swallow Godzilla and got blasted from the inside. Nakika. Nakika, this massive octopus-like creature, has a rich history with the folks on Kiribati Island. The ancient Austronesian people arrived on the island only to stumble upon this gargantuan squid with a giant shell protecting its brain. Fast forward a few centuries and the modern descendants still hold Nakika in high regard, considering it one of their gods. Described in the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelization, Nakika's a sight to behold. It's got this hefty streamlined body, at least eight chunky tentacles decked out with hundreds of suckers and arrowhead tips. The eyes are bright blue, the face is insect-like, and then there's the internal shell and its iridescent skin that just pops with color. Plus, it's got these black wing-like fins jutting out from its sides. This Titan's got a rep for gulping down entire ships, becoming the stuff of legends and nightmare fuel for sailors throughout history. Monarch's got Nakika pegged as a destroyer for its aggressive streak and violent past. So, yeah, not exactly the friendliest neighbor in the deep blue. Spore Mantis. The Spore Mantis is like your backyard stick insect, but supersized to the scale of a mighty redwood tree. This behemoth has a bark-like skin covering its muscle system, which is a unique blend of tendons and tree-like fibrous tissues. This setup allows it to hustle across the ground faster than you'd expect for something its size. Imagine you're chilling in the forest, thinking that General Sherman is the biggest tree around, but then, surprise! The Spore Mantis isn't just massive, it can actually chase you down. Inside its tree-like skin, there's a massive slug-like parasite, armed with spiky teeth and jaws that could crush bones. This creature doesn't just eat, it encases its prey in protein-rich sap, digesting them and then spitting out the leftovers as crystalline amber droppings. These droppings are a clear window into its diet, showing exactly what or who it's been munching on. Batra. Batra, the darker side of Mothra, came into existence about 12,000 years ago when Earth itself decided to whip up a guardian. Why? Well, an ancient civilization had gone too far with a climate controlling device. Batra took out the device but figured humans were Earth's real problem and aimed to wipe us out. Mothra wasn't on board with this, leading to an epic battle that left the ancient world in ruins and Batra sealed in the North Sea. In 1993, a meteor strike wakes Batra up and he's back on his anti-humanity mission, trashing Nagoya in larval form and then squaring off against Godzilla. After a tumble into a volcanic fault, he metamorphoses into his imago form, eventually teaming up with Mothra to take down Godzilla, but it cost him his life. His name's a blend of Battle and Mothra, and he's even been called Black Mothra by the cosmos. Design-wise, Batra's got two forms. The imago form is mostly black with massive wings featuring red, black, and yellow patterns. He's got yellow horns, six legs, red eyes that glow purple when firing beams, and a red line down his sides. The larval form is a black, yellow, and dark red mix with a giant glowing horn for blasting beams and tusks on his cheeks. He's got sturdy, horn-like yellow legs and red eyes. Size-wise, he's, uh, he's nearly as big as Godzilla. 
Manda. Manda, the serpent-like guardian of Mu, an underwater kingdom from the 1963 film Atragon, has a bit of a mysterious backstory. It's unclear how long he's been hanging around Mu, or even how he ended up as its protector. Design-wise, Manda's got that classic eastern dragon look, you know, long, slender body and four legs. In Atragon and Godzilla Final Wars, he sports bluish-green skin, four horns on his head, and in his original Atragon appearance, he's got face barbels like whiskers and a hairy mane running down his back. His eyes are yellow and reptilian, with those classic slit pupils. Manda's a pro at the constrictor move, wrapping himself around foes or structures to crush them. This move, dubbed Binding Breaker in Godzilla Final Wars, almost did in the Gotengo ship until an underwater volcano's heat made him let it go. In Godzilla Singular Point, Manda tried this trick on Godzilla Ultima, but ended up getting roasted by Godzilla's atomic breath. Titanosaurus. Titanosaurus, a massive sea dino, was pretty cool until Dr. Shinzo Mifune found him in 1960. Mifune, obsessed with controlling sea critters, especially Titanosaurus, got laughed out of the science club, but he kept at it, and by 1975, with his daughter Katsura and some help from the Black Hole Planet 3 aliens, he finally got his control device working. This turned the once peaceful Titanosaurus into a full-on rage monster. Physically, Titanosaurus is a deep sea dweller with a flashy fin from his tail to his head and smaller fins on his head. He's got a super long neck and a couple of antennas sticking out of his head. His skin is bright red with black and yellow specks, and his underbelly is beige, probably for camouflage. His eyes are big and bright yellow-orange, and he's got a forked tongue. Screenwriter Yukiko Takayama even called him a very quiet, friendly dinosaur. He only went berserk under Alien and Mifune's control, turning into a fierce fighter who could even tag-team with Mechagodzilla. The game Godzilla Unleashed says Titanosaurus isn't inherently evil, but he's got a grudge against humans for bothering him. In IDW's Godzilla comics, Titanosaurus is more aggressive, picking fights with kaiju like Rodan, but he's still a defender of Earth. He joins forces with Batra against Space Godzilla and teams up with Godzilla and others to fight the Trilopards. Adora. Adora, the pollution-loving alien, hitched a ride to Earth on a comet and quickly beefed up by chowing down on our pollution. Starting as a giant tadpole thing, Adora morphed through different forms, each more terrifying than the last. It went from a land-roaming beast to a toxic mist-spewing UFO, and finally a huge humanoid that towered over Godzilla. Adora met its match with Godzilla and a human-made device, but left us all wondering if pollution might spawn another one someday. No matter the form, tadpole, reptile, UFO, or giant, Adora's got this grey, kelp-like skin and freaky eyes with golden black irises and red sides that blink sideways. The Hedora in Godzilla Final Wars is a leaner, darker version, with red tubes and a whip-like left arm. It's mostly like the original humanoid form, but its other possible forms are a mystery. Hedora is not evil, per se. It's more about survival instincts. The destruction it brings is simply because of its weird biology. It even laughs while roughing up Godzilla and tries to drown him in sludge. In Godzilla Final Wars, Hedora is just a puppet under alien control, panicking and flailing when it's in a tight spot. In the comics, though, it's another story altogether. Baragon. The original Baragon, starring in Frankenstein vs. Baragon, was a bit of a bad guy, popping up at night to snack on livestock and people. Since most of his rampages were after dark, Bog mistakenly blamed Frankenstein. Things got personal when Baragon went after Frankenstein's pal Swako Tagami, which led to a fight where Frankenstein took him down but fell into a pit dug by Baragon. Baragon's essentially a four-legged reptile mammal mix with reddish-brown skin. He's got this big horn on his forehead and a bunch of spikes trailing down his head. It's something like a bulldog or pug with big ex expressive eyes and a squished muzzle. He also sports two rows of plate-like structures along his back and tail. Compared to his later millennium look, the 1965 Baragon had a more Godzilla-esque build. Smaller head, longer neck. His eyes were smaller, with cloudy white sclera and dark blue irises. His ears were tinier, with a less noticeable notch and longer connectors to his head. The spikes on his head sat further back, and he was wrinklier, with a smaller nose and more pronounced muzzle and upper lip. This Baragon was longer in the torso and tail and had more back plates. His hands, feet and claws were all on the dainty side with thinner, sharper claws. He was big on teeth, lots of small, needly light ones without any standout fangs. Overall, he was a sandy greyish brown, except for his horn and claws. Megalon. Megalon, the underground guardian of Seatopia, got pretty riled up after the surface world's nuke test wrecked his home. So, he popped up in Japan, causing a ruckus in Tokyo. Initially, he was following the lead of the hijacked robot Jet Jaguar, but Jet Jaguar shook off the Seatopian's control and turned on Megalon. Just when things were heating up, Gigan dropped in to give Megalon a hand. However, Godzilla showed up to back Jet Jaguar, and together they defeated Megalon and Gigan. Despite being an underground dweller, Megalon has some flashy colors. He has silver and gray tusks and claws, with a 
an orange and black shell and wings. His forelimbs end in these wicked drill-like appendages, always moving in sync with his arms. Now, when it comes to smarts, Megalon's not winning any genius awards. He's pretty easy to distract and temperamental to boot, like he followed Jet Jaguar around just out of curiosity and threw a fit when he lost sight of him. In a fight, he's not exactly a master tactician. He never uses his lightning horn beam and tends to just charge head-on, which doesn't always work out. He does better with a buddy, though. With Gigan, he held his own against Godzilla and Jet Jaguar for a while. But let's face it, without Gigan's help, Megalon probably wouldn't have lasted too long in that final showdown. Kumonga. Kumonga, the massive spider, has a mostly black body jazzed up with gold stripes. This big guy's got some black fuzzy hair, especially on his legs. His head's adorned with six eyes, usually blue, but they turn red when he's riled up. Around his mouth, he's got pincer-like claws and fangs. In the Showa series, he's got a mouth full of bristles and can shoot a venomous stinger, but these features got dropped in the Millennium series. In Godzilla Final Wars, Kumonga's got more and brighter gold stripes and its body angles more toward the ground. The black is lighter, and its skin texture is smoother. Godzilla's singular point gives Kumonga a makeover, mixing in some Megalon vibes. It's got two segments, with the first one large and housing the head and legs. The tops are smooth green with yellow stripes and the undersides red and segmented. Its head sticks out with a cap-like carapace, blue eyes and antenna. As far as its personality is concerned, Kumonga's a bit of a bruiser. In Son of Godzilla, all it likes is hunting. It's pretty territorial too, ready to throw down with other monsters that barge into its space. But in Destroy All Monsters, Kumonga is more peaceful with other monsters on Monster Island and Eva teams up in the big fight against King Ghidorah. In IDW's Godzilla comics, Kumonga starts off as just another rampaging monster, but ends up as a solid ally to Earth's monsters and Kiryu against space invaders. Megaguirus. Megaguirus was born out of a time-twisty situation because of a black hole weapon meant for Godzilla. A Meganula popped into our time, laid an egg, and Megaguirus arrived. First, as a bunch of Meganulons hatched by a kid, they morphed into Meganulas, ganged up on Godzilla to nab some of his power, and then juiced up their queen. The queen went through a mega transformation and emerged as the fearsome Megaguirus. Think of Megaguirus as Godzilla meets Meganula. She's got rough purple skin and greenish spikes covering her. Her head kinda resembles the head of Godzilla, ditching the insect antenna for a toothy reptilian mouth. Underneath, she's surprisingly ripped, with well-defined pectoral and abdominal muscles. She also has a long tail, ending in a sharp stinger. As for her personality, Mega Group, Mega Gearus is a queen and wants to dominate others. She's got a one-track mind to beat Godzilla and suck up his energy. She's fast and agile, using these skills to outmaneuver and overwhelm Godzilla. Scylla. Scylla. An armored cephalopod titan woke up from her Sedona, Arizona nap when King Ghidorah called in 2019. She wreaked havoc in Phoenix before Madison Russell's orca device in Boston calmed her down. After Godzilla took down Ghidorah, Scylla, along with other titans, showed up in Boston and bowed to Godzilla as the new alpha. Later, Scylla got into a tussle with the US Coast Guard while trying to snack on a nuclear warhead. Godzilla showed up and after a bit of a showdown, Scylla backed off. Appearance-wise, Scylla's a giant with a brown body and six long jointed legs with sparse hairs ending in big spiky claws. She's got a placid mantle with ten tentacles and a pair of orange peepers. She also has a huge shell, curving inward like an ammonite. In Godzilla Dominion, Scylla's got a bit of a makeover. She ditched the ammonite-like shell for a sloped one that curves downward. Instead of tentacles, she's now sporting over a dozen slender white tendrils coming out of her face. Monarch labels Scylla as a destroyer, a category she shares with some notorious titans like King Ghidorah, Muto, and Rodan. She's a radiation-hungry scavenger, always on the lookout for a next radioactive meal. This quest for nukes put her at odds with humans and even Godzilla, despite having earlier acknowledged him as the boss. King Caesar, the guardian monster of Okinawa's Azumi royal family, was a legend brought to life in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. Back in the day, he helped the locals fend off mainland invaders. Though the movie doesn't say it outright, some Godzilla lore hints he's more mystical construct than living being, with gold bones, concrete-like body reinforcements, and energy crystals for juice. Inspired by the Shisha, a mythical mix of dog and lion, King Caesar looks part mythical, part mammal. Standing on his hind legs, he's got this brown, brick pattern skin and light brown fur, mainly on his head. He sports a canine-like mug with sharp chompers, a flat nose, and red gemstone eyes that lack pupils. His triangular ears usually flop down but perk up when he's startled or fired up. King Caesar has a head crowned with protrusions, including a green gemstone-studded point on his forehead. His paws have three claws each and a short, fur-tipped tail that sticks out behind him. 
Gorosaurus. Gorosaurus, a big bad dino descendant of the Allosaurus from way back in the late Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago, made a modern day comeback. In King Kong Escapes, he was on Mondo Island, and by Destroy All Monsters, he was one of the main kaiju on Monsterland as the 20th century wrapped up. Design wise, Gorosaurus was modeled after the meat eater from the original King Kong. He has a classic dino stance, standing upright with his tail dragging, a big old head, beefy legs, and puny arms. Each hand has three fingers, staying true to his meat eater roots. His skin's all bumpy and scaly, with a spike on his tail's tip. Gigan, a real space terror, was sent to Earth by the M-Space Hunter Nebula aliens. The monster teamed up with King Ghidorah to take down human civilization. Gigan and Ghidorah wrecked the city until Godzilla and Anguirus crashed the party at a refinery. As could be expected, a wild brawl kicked off. With the Godzilla Tower's laser cannon, Gigan and Ghidorah nearly finished off Godzilla and Anguirus. But some quick-thinking humans blew up the tower, which was serving as the base of operations for the bad guys. This left Gigan and Ghidorah confused and at odds, giving Godzilla and Anguirus their comeback shot. The tables turned, and Gigan tried to bail but got blasted by Godzilla's atomic breath. King Ghidorah Dora followed suit and Earth was safe. For now, Gigan's known for being vicious in a fight, using his hook hands and buzzsaw to shred enemies. He doesn't play fair, often attacking downed foes. However, Gigan's also a bit of a chicken, quick to flee when things go south. In Godzilla Final Wars, Gigan's not the sharpest tool in the shed. He accidentally offs himself with his own razor discs. He's even a hero in the novel Godzilla Project Mechagodzilla, fighting for humanity against Godzilla. Gigan's a speed demon, flying at Mach 3 in Earth's atmosphere and an insane Mach 400 in space, encased in a diamond. He's a top-tier interstellar traveler, but in battles, he uses his flight more for hit-and-run tactics. Zilla. In Godzilla Final Wars, Zilla looks pretty much like the 98 TriStar Godzilla, thanks to his CGI model being a 3D scan of a Trendmaster's Ultimate Godzilla toy. The main difference comes with the back that's straight up instead of leaning forward. He's got tan skin with a blue top, mirroring the 98 version, but in daylight, he looks almost entirely light blue. Zilla also has loose skin under his neck, but it's not as spiky as the TriStar version. In Final Wars, Zilla's just following orders from the Zillions, causing chaos in Sydney. But when he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Godzilla, his head-on pounce attack doesn't end well for him. In Rulers of Earth, Zilla's a whole different beast, aggressive, vicious, and ready to rumble. He throws down with Godzilla in Honolulu, ducking and weaving and landing a few good hits. But when Godzilla starts getting the upper hand, Zilla knows when to call it quits and beats a hasty retreat. Zilla makes the waters around Monster Islands his home, steering clear of the other kaiju on land. Maya Squid. After his helicopter scrap, Kong was by a marsh, checking out his battle scars and grabbing a drink. That's when he spotted a sneaky Maya Squid, eyeing him for a surprise attack. Kong was in no mood for such nonsense and yanked the squid out of the water. After a quick tussle, Kong squashed the squid's head under his foot. Game over. He snacked on a few tentacles, then hauled the rest off for later. Maya Squids are like a mashup of a giant octopus and some squid features. They've got these big round heads with a pair of large eyes. True to their cephalopod nature, they have eight long arms decked out with suction cups, and their big like jaws can spin super fast, whipping up a whirlpool in the water. As for their nature, Maya squids are the lurking type, hanging out in Skull Island's waters waiting to ambush their next meal. They're huge, prehistoric cephalopods who keep it simple, hunt and survive. Kamazots. Kamazots, a creature straight out of nightmares, comes from the darkest corners of the Hollow Earth. The Iwi tribe on Skull Island knew about this guy, leaving behind ancient hieroglyphs near the island's Hollow Earth entrance that hinted at Kamazots' eventual rise, which they believed would cloak the island in an ever-ending storm. There's even an old Guarani prophecy calling him the Eternal Bat, a harbinger of doom for stars and mankind. Kamazots has a massive grey bat-like body with devilish horns and a face that's the stuff of horror flicks. His huge, ragged wings are all spiky doubling his forelimbs when he's not flying. He's armored up with angular plates covering his body. One of his horns looks like it's seen better days, probably a souvenir from an old scrap. He also has a black fur mane that runs down his back and neck. Inside his mouth, you'll find a bunch of jagged, dagger-like teeth, perfect for a creature of his caliber. His tail is long and spiky, and he can grab stuff with it. Living in the dark has left his eyes white and faded, and his blood is this eerie dark black-like oil. Shinomura. About 250 million years back, a Shinomura landed on a tiny island, munching on a massive sea creature's remains. But it didn't see Godzilla coming and got a blast of atomic breath. Then, a meteorite whacked the earth, messing up radiation levels and cracking open the ground. The Shinomura tumbled into one of those cracks, taking a long nap until 1945 when the Hiroshima atomic bomb jolted it awake. Post-nap, it started wreaking havoc on ships, growing bigger with each attack. But wherever Shinomura went, Godzilla was on its tail, chasing it off. Shinomura mainly showed up 
as gigantic, winged insect-like titans. They had blue segmented armor and black, filmy wings. They sported six glowing white eyes, three per side of their heads. Their bodies were long, snake-like, with scorpion-style prehensile tails. They had gnarly mouths with sharp plates and exomandibles. Sometimes you could catch a bright white glow beaming from inside their mouths. When they got really big, two long barbed tendrils sprouted underneath them. Varan. Varan, a prehistoric reptilian known as a Varanopode, survived from the Triassic right through to the Cretaceous. Dodging extinction, he spent millions of years at the bottom of a lake in Japan. The locals revered him as a deity, dubbing him the Baradagi Mountain God. In Destroy All Monsters, Varan appears as one of the many kaiju living on Monsterland by the end of the 20th century. While the film doesn't dish out much on him, outside sources hint that this version of Varan is just a youngster. Physically, Varan's a bit like a reptilian flying squirrel. He's mostly on all fours and uses thin membranes between between his arms and legs to glide around. He's got small eyes with big pupils, a round head and a short muzzled face with a bumpy nose and a prominent upper lip. His teeth are cone-shaped and vary in size. He's got a barrel-shaped torso with a beefy sternum, a thick neck and long, lean limbs. His face is adorned with spiky, fin-like structures, and he's got a row of big spines running from his head down to his long, grabby tail. His hands and feet are bony and have five digits each. The spines are almost see-through, lacking much color. His skin's a tail of two textures. The lower sides are smooth, slightly wrinkly and a creamy tan, while the top is darker brown and bumpy, like warts. These two areas are split by wavy membranes on his sides, limbs, and tail that flatten out for his gliding adventures. Ebira. Ebira is a humongous lobster or shrimp with a flair for drama. This big red guy has mismatched pincers, one's way bigger than the other. He's decked out with a couple of antenna and a sharp curved rostrum. That's the fancy term for his nose part. His body's got several segments and ends in a tail that's like a fan. In Ebira, Horror of the Deep, he's quite broad with a giant right claw, some crustacean whiskers, eyes on stalks, and a half dozen legs. He's got these intense brow ridges, spikes along his back, and a long scythe-like crest on his face. His mouth mouth set to the side, giving him a bit of a sideways glance. As far as its personality is concerned, Ebira's not your regular beachside organism. He loves destruction, smashing any watercraft nearby and snacking on humans trying to make a break for it. He's the self-appointed guardian of Lecce Island's waters, a fact that the red bamboo folks use to their advantage, keeping intruders at bay. They get past him with a special yellow liquid from the island's fruits. Ebira's got a bone to pick with Godzilla, challenging him twice, but both times it doesn't go well for him. Godzilla hands him a solid defeat and he even leaves him worse for wear after their second face-off. Kamakuras Kamakuras Essentially, a humongous praying mantis is known for its massive sickle-shaped claws and beady orange peepers. This big bug has antennas sticking out from its forehead and a row of spikes from its head to its back. Its mouth is flanked by large bristles and its wings, which tuck into its abdomen, are brown outside and orange inside. Camacurus has a hairy underbelly and a spear-like right arm, with the left shaped like a sickle. Camacurus is always the bad guy. In the Showa series, it's super aggressive. Even before its mutation, it was looming near the scientists on Solgal Island. Post-mutation, it wastes no time cracking open Manila's egg and roughing up the little guy. When Godzilla shows up, Kamakura stands its ground until its buddies get wiped out. It continues to cause trouble, taunting Godzilla's baby Manila and even picking on humans, only backing off when Godzilla steps in. In Godzilla Final Wars, Kamakura is a puppet of the Exilians, wrecking Paris and squaring off against Godzilla under their command. Gabara. Gabara, the dream-dwelling monster from All Monsters Attack, is like the schoolyard bully of Monster Island, representing Ichiro Miki's real-life tormentor, also named Gabara. This brute loves picking on Manila, Godzilla's little one, who's just too small to hold his own. Ichiro, Manila's new pal, and Kotsa concocts a clever plan to help Manila stand up to Gabara. But when Gabara feels cornered, he goes straight for the big guy, Godzilla, who quickly teaches him a lesson. Gabara's got this outlandish look, like a cross between a cranky cat with engine trouble and a mythical Oni from Japanese tales. Although there's a hint of toad in his design, he's mostly an Oni doppelganger, complete with turquoise reptilian scales and bright orange cat-like fur. His face is all mammal, but with a twist of demon flair, sporting three horns, just like the Oni. His zappy touch is another nod to Oni legends, which often link these creatures to lightning and thunder. Gabara's whole vibe is a mix of folklore terror and playground tyrant. Jet Jaguar Jet Jaguar, the brainchild of the Japanese inventor Goro Ibuki, is a tale of tech gone rogue, but in the coolest possible way. Initially hijacked by the Cetopians to lead their beast Megalon on a rampage, Goro managed to break the remote control, only to find Jet Jaguar had gained self-awareness and upgraded himself. Embracing his autonomy, Jet Jaguar called on Godzilla for backup and went full giant mode to throw down with Megalon and Gigan. Design-wise, 
Jet Jaguar's a humanoid robot with a head sharp enough to make a point. His face is a grid of square eyes, usually dark blue with occasional bright blue flashes, a triangle for a nose, and a rectangular jaw. There's also this vent across his face that gives off a perpetual robot grin. Color-wise, he's a silver base with splashes of red, yellow, and blue all over. His hips are red, knees yellow, and legs blue, all finished off with silver feet sporting a blue arrow design. Around his neck, arms, hips, and legs, he's got this segmented blue padding. When Jet Jaguar takes to the skies, antenna pop out from those ear-like structures on his head, making him look even more awesome. The Giant Condor The Giant Condor a monstrous bird beefed up by nuclear waste from the red bamboo on Lecce Island decided to tangle with Godzilla right after the big G had dusted off a squad of red bamboo jets. Bad move. This oversized bird, all beak and talons, went all in with a scrap against the king of monsters. But let's face it, it was out of its league. Godzilla wasn't having any of it and lit up the giant condor with a fiery blast of atomic breath, sending it crashing into the ocean. In terms of staying power, the giant condor didn't really have much. It was more like a featherweight in a heavyweight fight. One solid hit from Godzilla's atomic breath was all it took to take it out of the skies. Tough luck for the giant bird. Amulek Titanus Amulek is like a nightmarish blend of nature and demon. It's a massive dark figure with ten glaring yellow eyes, staring without blinking. He's got these eerie face tendrils that end in shock pads, swaying like creepy fingers. His mouth is a nightmare of needle teeth with a tongue that's pretty much a bony weapon. Interestingly, Amulek is essentially a walking telekinetic plant. Apart from his head, spine, and some nerves, the rest of him is a writhing mass of vegetation. In Godzilla Dominion, he has vine-like forelimbs that stretch out ridiculously long and end in huge clawed hands. You can spot blue veins throbbing all over his plant body, which stands on four stout tree trunk legs, and jutting from his back are these tree-like growths, making him look like a walking forest from a horror story. As far as its personality is concerned, Amulek is rather a no-chill titan. He's all about aggression, staking his claim, and not afraid to get rough about it. But even he knows when to back down, showing a mix of fear and respect toward Godzilla, the Alpha Titan. Don't mistake his retreat for weakness, though. Amya looks a sly fighter, using his long-range plant limbs to smack down foes without getting too close. He's even tried to drown Behemoth, playing on the fact that he's more of a land lover. Monarch's got him pegged right as a destroyer. He's not the Titan you'd want to bump into on a forest hike. Tiamat, the massive sea serpent from the Hollow Earth, didn't roll out the welcome mat when Godzilla showed up to reclaim his old digs. She's got all dark purple scales, glowing fins, and sharp plates, with a bunch of bubbles hanging off a beaked face and these piercing yellow eyes. So Godzilla steps into what used to be his lair, and it didn't take long for the confrontation to start. Tiamat wraps around him like a python dragging him into a swirling underwater battle. Her scales are like knives, slicing into Godzilla. He tries to headbutt her, only to get a face full of blinding acidic breath. But Godzilla's, of course, no rookie. He senses her sneaking up behind him and turns the tables, grabbing her by the throat and tossing her onto dry land. Despite a relentless stomping from Godzilla, Tiamat doesn't back down, gutsy as ever. But Godzilla's roar, that deep, king of the monsters bellow, finally gets her to back down. With a last defiant glance, she slips back into the water, leaving Godzilla to his reclaimed lair. Snare Hunters Snare Hunter ants are the titans of the insect world, with a variety of sizes and roles depending on their cast. From the dog-sized foragers to the colossal 130-foot queens, they're a sight to behold. Covered in mossy textures and sporting antenna that mimic dead shrubs, these giants could easily be mistaken for moving parts of the forest. The foragers, the little guys of the colony, are busybodies, always on the move. Then you've got the Guardians, the beefy protectors in natural armor, which makes them a formidable line of defense. And let's not forget the Queens, the heart of the colony, with the massive wings and intimidating mandibles. Their underbellies are like a night sky full of bioluminescent dots, perfect for blending in when they take flight. Snare hunter ants live in sprawling underground colonies, buzzing with activity. Each ant knows its job. Whether it's hunting, guarding, or building, the queens are classified as protectors by monarch, and they're pretty elusive, usually sticking to the depths of the colony, focusing on keeping the population booming. But when push comes to shove, like if their home is under attack, these queens will surface, ready to defend their kingdom with all their might. Minilla, the pint-sized Godzilla whippersnapper, might be little in size, but he's huge in the heart. Whether he's Godzilla's biological kiddo or just an adopted little one, Minilla's story starts with an egg on Solgal Island cracked open by some nosy Kamakuras. In Godzilla Final Wars, this little guy pops up near Mount Fuji. Unlike his more menacing counterparts, Manila's a real people-pleaser, showing a fondness for human company that's a rarity among his kind. Think of him as the friendly neighborhood Godzilla, with a penchant for kid-like shenanigans, like a game of giant boulder soccer or tail-riding joyrides on Godzilla's back. Eh, boy does he get a kick out of breathing atomic fire, especially when he thinks no one's watching. However, Manila's got his brave moments too, even though he's often outmatched in the monster brawl department. Moguera Moguera 
the metallic beast straight out of a sci-fi nightmare. First showed up as an earth-shaking weapon in Japan. It's a giant robot with the grace of a bulldozer, causing earthquakes while sneaking around underground. When it finally popped up, it went on a full-blown rampage until the JSDF demolished a bridge to send it crashing down. But the Mysterians, the creators of Maguera, weren't done yet. They rolled out Maguera 2.0 to guard their dome, but luck wasn't on the side. The bot goofed up, got too close to a marker-like cannon, and boom, game over, Maguera. Now, Maguera is like a walking, clunky metal fortress. It's got this steel grey, stripy chest and thunder thighs, and its arms and shins are decked out in a snazzy bluish green. Topping it off, it's got a golden head with eyes that look like they're trying to escape from its massive drill nose. It's got these funky antenna that wiggle around and tuck away when it's time to burrow, and its hands and feet are like the robotic versions of mittens and boots. In the Heisei version, Maguera is the sleek modern cousin of the original, all shiny silver with a black nose and hands, and some cool blue highlights. It's got this plasma cannon chest port that's all the rage in robot fashion and tank treads for feet because who needs toes when you've got treads? Hmm. This Maguera's eyes are a striking yellow and it's got a single antenna that's less wiggly and more businesslike. Bramble Boar The Bramble Boars from the Monster vs. Monarch Legacy of Monsters are basically your wild boars on steroids. These hulking beasts could easily tower over any person, making them more like walking tanks than anything else. But here's the kicker. They're not just massive and wild, they've got a bit of Mother Nature's flair. Picture this. Parts of their bodies are sprouting with plant-like growths, making them look like they've just rolled out of an enchanted forest. It's like nature decided to do a mashup between a botanical garden and a boar. These bramble boars are no ordinary pigs. They're like the guardians of the wild, massive and commanding, with a touch of green magic. Kong's parents. Kong's folks, the last of their kind on Skull Island, were real survivors. His dad was a massive creature, a seasoned warrior, hardened by battles with the skull crawlers. He was a colossal gorilla with an eye lost in battle, scars etched across his body. A true beast. His mom, she was just as gigantic, but with a softer edge, more rounded. Her long hair a bit of a telltale sign of her gender in the otherwise indistinguishable giant gorilla world. In the end, they were the only two left, standing tall against the skull crawler menace. Then came the dramatic moment that changed the history of Skull Island. In a battlefield, Kong's mom goes into labor. It's chaos, but they fight tooth and nail, ensuring their baby boy is born safely. They manage to get tiny Kong to safety in a cave, but that's where their story ends. Overwhelmed by the skull crawlers, little Kong comes out later, only to find his parents gone, taken down by the very monsters they fought to protect him from. And so begins Kong's own journey, driven by the legacy of his parents, determined to keep the island safe just like they did. Magma Turtle The Magma Turtle, a unique Skull Island native, is a real sight to behold. These gargantuan turtles call the area around Hellspring Peak, a fiery volcano, their home. Their eggs are nestled right in the heart of the volcano. When they hatch, the molten magma wraps around the little guys, cooling off to form a tough, rocky shell. So you could say they look like they're mini moving mountains. As they grow up, these turtles keep heading back to the volcano. It's like a spa day for them, but instead of mud baths, they get their shells reforged in the lava. Their scientific name, Tortoisa Volcana, is a mix of the tortoise and the Russian word for volcano which is pretty fitting. Despite their fearsome statue-like appearance, magma turtles are pretty peaceful, leaf-munching vegetarians. They've got no fear of predators. Why? Well, because of their rock-solid shells and their blood, which is like boiling lava. Mantle Claw Mantle Claws are these massive, multi-legged beasts that likely evolved in the Hollow Earth. They're basically the masters of camouflage, blending in perfectly with the rocky plains until something big like Kong stumbles upon them. They're not top of the food chain, though. Bigger predators like the Hollow Earth lizards often snack on them. Back in 73, during a monarch expedition to Skull Island, Bill Randa had a close encounter with a Mantle Claw. He was running from a mother longlegs and accidentally woke up a snoozing Mantle Claw. What followed was a full-on monster brawl, ending with the spider skewering the Mantle Claw and both tumbling into the ocean. These creatures are armored, like tanks, with spiky shells that could be mistaken for rocks. They've got creepy, finger-like claws and surprisingly small faces. And despite looking like something out of an arachnid nightmare, they're actually more like vertebrates, with a proper skeleton and all. In Skull Island, there's a slightly different version of these guys. They're more crab-like, flatter, and with huge pincer claws that can give a nasty pinch. These ones have a pair of smaller arms near their mouths and lack the long tails of their Hollow Earth cousins. As for their behavior, Monarch tags them as destroyers. However, they're the type that minds their own business unless provoked. Leviathan Leviathan is pretty much the Loch Ness Monster's version of Monsterverse. Yep, the same one that's got folks speculating about secret underwater tunnels. So, this beast has been living in Loch Ness, right under the noses of these cryptid buffs on the ship called Once in a Maritime. 
They even had a snap of it, similar to that famous 1934 surgeon's photograph of Nessie. In Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Monarch had their eyes on it, so they set up Outpost 49 in Scotland. When Ghidorah went all, hey, Titans, parties this way, and invited them to the monster parade, Leviathan busts out of Loch Ness, ready to join the Titan pack on a hunting spree. But it doesn't make it to Boston in time for the big showdown, so it misses Godzilla claiming the Alpha title. Leviathan's got this knack for cruising in and out of Loch Ness, probably using those Hollow Earth tunnels. In fact, this idea that Ness has got an underwater highway to the sea is not so far-fetched now. And Leviathan being in Loch Ness is a sly nod to Nessie from Godzilla, the series. Nessie. This creature is a mosasaur from Loch Ness, and she's got this thing where she pops up every 20 years for a bit of romance. Life's chill for her until some scientist nabs her kiddo, aiming to cash in on the unique baby. This brings into the picture an organization called HEAT, who get wind of Nessie's ruckus at the scientist's place. HEAT stood for Humanitarian Environmental Analysis Team, which was formed by Nico Totopoulos to fight and study the mutations that kept appearing all over the world. Meanwhile, Godzilla rolls up and he and Nessie get into a couple of fights, both on terra firma and in the drink. But Nessie's not just throwing a tantrum, she's a mom on a mission, trying to get a baby back. The whole situation turns a corner when Randy from Heat broadcasts the baby's cries over the lock, and Nessie zones in on it. Godzilla, getting the whole picture, decides to play the hero. He teams up with Nessie, and they crack open the cage, holding her little one. Mom and baby reunited, they take off into the lock, exchanging roars with Godzilla like some kind of monster farewell salute. Now, there was this grim future where these evil kaiju called Dragmas or democratic resurgence against a global mechanized Armageddon almost wiped them out. But thanks to Heat zipping back to the past and taking out the Dragma younglings, Nessie and her offspring dodged that bullet. Sekhmet Sekhmet's story was rather hidden away in Cairo, Egypt, where Monarch discovered her in a deep slumber. They built Outpost 65 right there to keep an eye on her. When Ghidorah sent out a rallying cry, Sekhmet woke up, broke free, and joined the rampaging Titan gang, leaving a trail of destruction that included a smashed railway. Sekhmet missed the ultimate Titan face-off in Boston, though. She didn't get to see Godzilla take the throne as the Alpha Titan. In Godzilla, King of the Monsters, we don't see her in action, but there's this ancient carving in the movie's opener. It shows Sekhmet as a lioness with a stylish, thin mane flowing from head to back. What makes her unique is her bird-like legs with sharp claws and feathery wings, giving off serious sphinx or lioness vibes. Director Michael Doherty emphasized these feline traits. Mokeli Mbembe In Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Mokeli Mbembe is a mighty monster that's contained at Monarch Outpost 75 in Jebel Barkal, Sudan. The novelization paints him as a colossal grey quadruped, rocking a pebbled reptilian back and a unique head that's a cross between an earless elephant and a crook minus the upward tusks. This guy has numerous claws, sporting five on each foot, and his front legs are just a bit longer than the back ones. His massive tail, about two-thirds his body length, can slice through an osprey or even shred a pyramid. Makele Mbembe is not all about size. He's tough as nails, too. His reptilian back can shrug off missile blasts like they're nothing, and his trunk is similar to a high-speed weapon. Super agile and perfect for snatching things on the move. Of course, we can't forget the razor-sharp set of teeth. Add to that a curved horn on his head that emits a soft green glow. Yamata no Orochi Orochi, the legendary eight-headed serpent, has had quite the evolution in its cinematic portrayals. In the film titled The Three Treasures, it appeared as a massive snake with eight heads and a cluster of smaller tails, all clad in grey scales. In Orochi, the eight-headed dragon, it went through a makeover. This Orochi was bulkier, with a hefty body, short legs, and a vibrant red colour, sporting a collection of yellow horns on its heads and small spikes on a singular large tail. In Brush of the Guard, Orochi's look shifted to a more slug-like physique draped in purple scales. This time, it's down three heads, leaving behind grey stump, and one of the surviving heads is a lifeless grey. Each head is adorned with distinctively coloured spikes and horns, while yellow scales trail down its necks to the tail. Its body is edged with black claw-like structures and a contrasting red underside. In The Three Treasures, Orochi's tail is woven from mythology. Annually emerging from a lake to consume one of the Earth deity's children, Orochi meets its match in Susano. The storm god cunningly traps the beast's heads with snake-laden trees, then delivers two fatal sword strikes to its tail, slaying the monster and reclaiming the sword Kusanagi no Surugi. In the Monsterverse, Tatanus Yamata no Orochi, stationed at Monarch Outpost 91 near Mount Fuji, awakens under King Ghidorah's call. This titanic force wreaks havoc, first by menacing a cruise ship in the Pacific Ocean as it headed southeast, marking a new chapter in its long storied existence.
Bunyip. Titanus Bunyip, a cryptic entity from Legendary's Monsterverse, is housed inside Monarch Outpost 99 near Australia's iconic Ayers Rock. This creature draws its name from the Bunyip of Australian Aboriginal mythology, a being steeped in tales of terror and intrigue since the early 1800s. Known for its monstrous roar, the Bunyip is a figure of fear in indigenous lore and early European settler accounts. Bunyip's physical form in the Monsterverse is rather unknown, and not much can be gathered from the varied and often conflicting descriptions from historical sightings. Some depict it as hippopotamus-like, others liken it to a manatee or even an alligator-bird hybrid. Central to all these accounts, however, is the Bunyip's long neck, a distinctive trait that weaves through its myriad representations. In its native legends, the Bunyip is often portrayed as an amphibious nocturnal predator, lurking in swamps and freshwater bodies, with a particular taste for women and children. This sinister nature suggests that the monster versus Bunyip could be a gigantic long-necked titan, possibly with the body of a hippopotamus. Abaddon. In Wyoming, Monarch Outpost 77 keeps watch over Tatanus Abaddon. Abaddon is a name that comes from ancient scripture and can be found in various tales of darkness and destruction. In the Book of Revelation, the name Abaddon conjures images of an angelic figure commanding a fearsome locust army. Known as the Angel of the Abyss and often linked to the notions of destruction and death, some interpretations even label Abaddon as the Antichrist or an alias of Satan himself. Kraken. The Kraken, although not named in the show Skull Island, got its nickname from creator Brian Duffield and is also referred to as such on Powerhouse Animation's model sheet. Interestingly, this name is shared with another titan, Nakika. Brian Duffield mentioned on Twitter that he wasn't aware of the name duplication as it wasn't pointed out by Legendary. The Skull Island soundtrack even has a track called Sea Beast, hinting at the Kraken. In the show, characters typically call it a sea monster or squid. In terms of design, the Kraken is a unique blend of various sea creatures but primarily resembles a cephalopod. It has an octopus-like head and a human-like torso extending from its mouth area. Its beak is sharp and serrated, lined with teeth and positioned at the front, giving it a more traditional face. The creature boasts a large sail on its head, four pink eyes, six gill slits, and crustacean-like antennules besides its mouth. It has 20 appendages in total, two crustacean pincers, six blue cephalopod arms, and eight retractable red tentacles. The last four appendages, used instead of legs, have hooked barbs. It also sports a long, fish-like tail. Some parts of its body can glow bioluminescent. As far as its personality is concerned, the Kraken is depicted as ruthless and relentless. It wiped out all Spanish islanders on Skull Island to lure Kong and even hurled a whale from the ocean onto the island to provoke him. The Kraken reacts fiercely to any attack, regardless of the threat level. This was evident when it caught and returned a harpoon thrown at it by Mike. Charlie describes the Kraken as being obsessed with destruction. Muto Prime. Muto Prime is an ancient titan, living alongside Godzilla and other legendary creatures. It's known for preferring Godzilla's species as host for its young due to their size and strength. This choice, however, meant Muto Prime had to evolve to become a formidable adversary to Godzilla's kind, making it a specialized threat to them. Dr. Emma Russell, a monarch scientist, speculates that Muto Prime might be either an adult female Muto or the last of its kind from a prehistoric Muto outbreak. In an epic showdown with a Godzilla species member called Dagon by ancient Phoenicians and later attacked species 5146 underscore Adam by Monarch, Muto Prime came out on top. It infected Dagon with its parasitic spores, leading to Dagon's death and eventual burial in a Philippine cave. Fast forward to 1999, mining activities unearthed Dagon's skeleton, releasing a larval male Muto, while another dormant spore ended up hatching into a female Muto in 2014. Appearance-wise, Muto Prime shares a basic design with its offspring but is much bigger and tougher, sporting a hard shell and sharp back spines. It's got massive muscular legs and forelimbs for knuckle walking. Its skin is mostly smooth and black, but its spiked forelimbs stand out with an orange hue thanks to the lava-like blood within. Its red veins indicate hotter bloodstreams. In terms of behavior, Monarch labels Muto Prime as a destroyer, like other formidable titans such as King Ghidorah and Mechagodzilla. Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, a giant bird-like titan, first popped up in southern Mexico, wrecking small villages for nest-building materials. Heat went to Mexico for a closer look and teamed up with Lawrence Cohen, the guy who first stumbled upon the creature. They got a nasty surprise from Quetzalcoatl while exploring an ancient ruin, but Monique saved the day by triggering a mini-eruption that scared the bird off. The team's next encounter wasn't so smooth. The tranquilizers couldn't pierce Quetzalcoatl's hide, so they brainstormed a new plan with some scorpion venom. Meanwhile, Quetzalcoatl tore through another town, 
and during a tense moment, snatched Elsie with its massive talons, intending to feed her to its chicks. As heat scaled a mountain to rescue Elsie, Quetzalcoatl attacked again. They signaled Godzilla for help with their robot, Nigel, which got destroyed in the process. Just in time, Godzilla showed up for a showdown. The team managed to save Elsie and Cohen from the bird's hatchlings. Godzilla then shoved Quetzalcoatl into its nest and caused a rock slide with its atomic breath, sending Quetzalcoatl and its young into a lava stream, ending their reign of terror. Quetzalcoatl isn't actually seen in Godzilla, King of the Monsters, but an ancient carving of it appears in the opening credits. This carving shows Quetzalcoatl as a bird-like creature with two talons, a serpentine body, and a saurian tail. Its head has backward-sweeping horns and a streamlined beak, plus two large bat-like wings. The carving details grooves that likely represent feathers or scutes. Giant Mutant Widow Spider In the Godzilla The Series episode website, some seriously freaky giant mutant widow spiders surfaced in South America. First, they attacked a guy in the jungle, which got heat and the military involved. The team nabbed a few tiny spiders, but then a whole bunch of them swarmed in. It turned out these spiders were tough nuts, immune to most pesticides. Then the big boss, the Queen Mutant Widow Spider, showed up at the military base for a showdown with Godzilla. She tried to web him up, but Godzilla wasn't having any of it, and both critters ended up backing off. Back at her lair, the Queen popped out more eggs. Heat in the military, after some digging, figured out that some special flower pollen could paralyze these creepy crawlies. They tried this tactic at the spider nest, but got ambushed by more spiders. Cue Godzilla to the rescue. He took down the spiders, and Heat got a pat on the back for their smart thinking. As for the spiders themselves, the baby ones are white with a red pattern on the backs, just like real baby black widows, but with seven eyes and a bunch of fangs and mandibles. The grown-ups are bigger and sport an aqua blue color instead of white. The queen spider is a whole different level of scary. Bulkier, navy blue with spikes, red patterns, spinnerets, stingers, and a head full of eyes, fangs, and what look like human teeth. Talk about nightmare material. Killer Chameleon. In episode 7 of Skull Island, titled You're Not a King, You're Just a Stupid Animal, Kong teams up with a Spanish Skull Islander to track down who killed a scared buffalo. They find three killer chameleons feasting on a carcass. Ignoring the islander's warnings, Kong drops a boulder on one chameleon's tail, trapping it, and jumps into the fray with bone blades in hand. One chameleon spots the islander and scrambles up the canyon wall. Kong tries throwing his bone blades but misses. He's about to chase when another chameleon blocks him. Meanwhile, the islander narrowly avoids a tongue attack and pins the chameleon's tongue to the ground. However, she gets knocked off the edge by its tail. Kong, battling a chameleon, notices and tries to save her, but fails. Thankfully, the hawk monster catches her. As the fight heats up, a chameleon claws Kong's leg and climbs onto him, pushing him down. Kong fights back, eventually smashing the chameleon into its trapped comrade with a boulder. On the ledge, the free chameleon attacks the hawk monster, enraging Kong. Another chameleon jumps Kong, biting him. Kong bashes it against the wall, while the hawk monster shakes off its attacker, sending it plummeting. The falling chameleon tries grabbing the islander with its tongue, but impels itself on a bone. Still, it keeps trying to snag the islander. Kong keeps smashing the other chameleon, finally killing it against the wall. The sediment wall crumbles, burying and killing the remaining chameleon. These killer chameleons are no ordinary lizards. They're massive, carnivorous, with a spiked crest, small sharp teeth, spiked forelimbs, and a prehensile purple tongue. They're mostly moss green, but can change colors, including gray, red, brown, purple, and orange. Perfect for ambushes. Rockbugs. In Skull Island TV series, Episode 2, The Last Blank Space on the Map, Cap has his first run-in with a rock bug on Skull Island. Initially mistaking it for just a big rock, he's taken aback when it turns out to be a huge insect with dazzling blue and aquamarine geodes on its chest. The creature growls, making it clear it's not friendly. Luckily, one of Irene's mercenaries jumps in with machine gun fire, but the bug quickly overpowers him, returning to its rock disguise. Meanwhile, in Episode 8, Charlie gets a surprise of his own. While dodging trapdoor crabs on a beach, he unknowingly grabs a baby rock bug. Startled, he chucks it away, which then draws the crab's attention. The bug makes a quick escape, leaving Charlie and Mike exposed and in a bit of a pickle. These rock bugs are like giant ant-like insects. They're grey with black eyes, hooked antenna, and a pair of grey fangs on each mandible. They've got six pairs of legs, with the fifth pair sporting three small spikes. The torso looks like a blue-green diamond with a hole in the middle, outlined in purple, resembling a starry night sky. Their backs are brown, woodlouse-like, and have a shell that mimics a large rock. The baby rock bugs are just smaller versions of the adults. Vine Snake In the Breakfast Fit for a Kong episode, a sneaky vine snake keeps an eye on Charlie, Annie, Mike, and Dog as they trek through the jungle. Later on, a gang of eight vine snakes brings a surprise tack on a bunch of Irene's mercenaries. These guys were busy trying to coax Annie and Dog out into the open when the snakes made the move. 
skeleton of a dead creature. In Godzilla vs Kong, Kong stumbles upon an ancient stone temple deep in the hollow earth, which turns out to be a relic of his ancestors. Here, he finds a massive axe stuck in the skull of some unknown beast. Kong yanks the axe out of the skull and, feeling the moment, beats his chest and lets out a triumphant roar. A fun fact from the official movie novelization. Eileen Andrews, a character in the story, guesses that the skull might belong to a member of Godzilla's species based on its looks. But in the actual film, the skull seems more bear-like than anything else. Trapdoor Crab. In Skull Island TV series, particularly in episodes 2 and 8, Charlie and Mike have a close call with some trapdoor crabs. These crabs are like huge regular crabs with big red claws, small orange eyes, and long thin antenna. Their bodies are rounded and grey, with three sharp legs on each side and fanged mouths hidden behind their mandibles. The duo's encounter with these crabs happen after they're stranded on Skull Island's shores. A trapdoor crab pops up from the sand, aiming for Charlie, but he dodges. Another crab snatches Mike by the leg and starts dragging him. Charlie's quick move help free Mike even as more crabs emerge, snapping their claws threateningly. Stuck on a rock, Mike tries a distraction by tossing a seashell, which draws the crabs out. They spot a small crustacean, and a trapdoor crab pulls it under. Charlie, mistaking a baby rock bug for a rock, throws it at the crabs. The bug dodges their attacks, and the crabs refocus on Mike and Charlie, only to suddenly retreat into the sand. Later, Annie saves Charlie from another crab attack by hurling a spear. She also uses a harpoon to fend off several crabs swarming them. When one crab knocks Charlie down, down, Mike holds it back. Charlie escapes and throws the harpoon to Mike, who uses it to fend off the crab. The crab eventually retreats, spooked by Kong's roar. Aloe Turtle. There's this unique turtle that pops up in Episode 2, and Irene casually refers to it as an Aloe Turtle thing in Episode 6. This critter is basically a tortoise with a twist. Instead of a regular shell, it's got these big thorny green and orange aloe leaves. Its skin is a rocky grey colour with lumpy textures, and it sports yellow eyes and a serrated beaky mouth. The first time Irene and Cap come across this turtle is pretty cool. They're checking out what they think is just a big aloe bush on Skull Island. But then, surprise, the bush gets up, and it's actually this Aloe Turtle. The creature just groans a bit and ambles off, leaving them pretty amazed. Dog. Dog's story on Skull Island is a bit of a tearjerker. As a puppy, he lost his parent in a brutal skirmish with Annie and her dad, who were stranded in a wrecked ship. Sadly, both Dog's parent and Annie's dad didn't make it, leaving both Dog and Annie parentless. The silver lining? Dog and Annie found each other, started sharing their grub, and quickly became inseparable besties. They've been living and surviving together on what Annie calls Annie's Island for about ten years, having all sorts of wild adventures. It was Annie who named him Dog. Physically, Dog's a beast, bigger and buffer than a human, with a thick mane running from his neck to mid-back, and some pretty gnarly spikes on his back. He's got sturdy muscular limbs, bushy eyebrows, and large pointy ears poking out of his mane. He's got this squished face look, like those brachycephalic dog breeds, with teeth from his lower jaw sticking out over his upper lip. As far as its personality is concerned, dogs as loyal and protective as they come, especially when it comes to Annie. He's not officially her pet, but acts like one, always ready to put himself on the line for her. Dog's a pro hunter too, leaping on prey when needed. He's not all cuddles and wagging tails though. Dog's pretty wary of strangers like Mike and Charlie, but after seeing Mike trying to bond with him, Dog warms up a bit, even letting Mike hop on for a ride. Still, he keeps his guard up around the team. Dog's main thing is keeping Annie safe. He's super vigilant and dedicated to her, showing a fierce loyalty that's pretty admirable. He's got this instinct to protect her at all costs, making him a pretty complex protective and cautious creature. Croc Monster. In Skull Island, Charlie, Mike, and one of Irene's guys got a nasty surprise from a croc monster while trying to escape Doug. This monster popped out of a river and gobbled up the mercenary before he could even react. Mike and Charlie, stunned for a moment, made a break for it, diving into the river. The croc monster stayed on land but kept swiping at them as they were swept away by the current. Charlie figured out the croc was herding them toward a waterfall. They tried to swim to shore but ended up going over the edge. The croc, perched on a rock above the waterfall, seemed to vanish, making them think they'd lost it. But nope, the creature dove gracefully into the water and kept up the chase. Just as it was about to catch them, Kong swooped in, grabbed the croc, and chowed it down in one go. This croc monster is like a crocodile on a thousand barrels of steroids. It's got these big osteoderms and scutes running down its back in three rows, making a triangular pattern. Think natural body armor. The middle row is a bit bigger than the others. Despite its huge size, its skull is relatively small, and its jaws are packed with sharp, needle-like teeth. Its eyes are a pale yellow and seem to lack pupils. What's wild is its limbs. They're kind of cat-like, giving it some serious speed and agility on land. It can even stand up on two legs for a bit. The croc is a relentless hunter. It wasted no time chasing after Mike and Charlie, showing it's not one to give up easily. The thing even threw itself down a waterfall to keep the pursuit going. This just goes to show how driven and adaptable it is when it comes to hunting. 
Grass hedgehog. In Skull Island, we get a glimpse of these fluffy mammals called grass hedgehogs. They're covered in dense long fur all over, but what really catches the eye are the orange vegetation-like protrusions sticking out of their backs. These creatures have two yellow eyes, a black cat-like nose, and three-toed feet with sharp claws. Grass hedgehogs make noises similar to house cats, soft meows, and the occasional screech. They even bark sometimes, which adds to their quirky vocal range. As far as its personality is concerned, they're mostly chill. When Cap, Eileen, and the mercenary crew bumped into one, it just looked at them, meowed as if saying hello, and just went about its business. No drama. But in a different scene, one of these creatures got snatched up by Kong's hawk pal and was clearly freaked out. It tried to escape, but ended up as a snack for Kong. Dodo Bird. In the breakfast fit for a Kong episode, Charlie and Mike find themselves in a bit of a standoff with a huge Dodo Bird. Things heat up after Annie and Dog leave them behind to scout for breakfast. Mike tries to scare it off, but the Dodo Bird isn't having any of it and charges full tilt at them. Charlie's not exactly thrilled, but Mike's all pumped up for a brawl. Just as they're about to throw down, Dog swoops in and takes the bird down, grabbing its neck and slamming it to the ground. It lights out for the Dodo Bird in no time. Annie then pops up, casually announcing that they're having the bird for breakfast. That's when Charlie Charlie realizes they've been used as bait. Next thing, they're all sitting around a fire, roasting the dodo bird for a meal. Talk about a wild morning on Skull Island. Venus flytrap creature. In the breakfast fit for a Kong episode, Cap, Irene, and Sam have a close call in a field full of giant yellow flowers. Things take a turn when one of these flowers, actually a huge Venus flytrap creature, snaps up Irene out of nowhere. With Irene caught in its massive jaws, Sam jumps into action, slicing through the flower stem with a machete. Then he and Cap pull Irene out, breaking off the tendrils that were gripping her. After the tense rescue, Irene and Sam can't help but chuckle at the irony of a botanist nearly becoming plant food. But then they're both taken aback to see Cap gently comforting the wilting flytrap creature. Quite the unexpected moment in the midst of their Skull Island adventure. Dog's father. In the episode Breakfast Fit for a Kong, Annie casually drops a bombshell on Mike and Charlie, revealing that she and Dog became friends after their dads took each other out. Dog's dad shows up in a couple of flashbacks during Terms of Endearment. In the first one, we see him using his claw to bust a hole in the hull of a ship that brought Annie and her dad to the island she names after herself. The second flashback is pretty somber. Annie stumbles upon his body on the beach right after she's done burying her own dad. Hearing some noises, she cautiously approaches with a plastic shovel, only to find Dog there equally hard heartbroken. Scared and overwhelmed, she bolts back to the safety of the ship. Night Boy. On Skull Island, Mike, his dad Charlie, and Dog hatch a plan to distract Irene's team and save Annie. They try to set a tree on fire to grab attention, but they accidentally stir up a bunch of Night Boys sleeping around it. These creatures blend in so well that they look like a part of the tree. Instead of creating a diversion, Mike and Charlie end up waking these goblin-like creatures, which immediately start attacking them. These goblins have a pretty eerie look. They're kinda semi-walking on all fours, with grey skin and four-clawed limbs. They've got these long, thin tails and large black spikes jutting out of the back but their heads are the real showstoppers. Huge fangs, knife-like mandibles, and a lower jaw that curves upward without any teeth. They've got four yellow eyes without pupils and these crest-like things on their skulls. When they're not causing chaos, they're usually chilling on dead tree trunks, lying flat to blend in. These guys are super aggressive and don't take kindly to being woken up. They stick together in big groups on dead trees, spikes out, probably both for shelter and to scare off bigger predators. Their pack mentality suggests they're quite the social bunch, at least among themselves giant centipede. In the Skull Island series, there's this colossal centipede that makes regular ones look like ants. This thing is so big, it towers over humans. During a showdown with Cap, this giant bug gets all up in his business, making these intense chittering and hissing sounds. As far as its personality is concerned, it's all about the hunt. This centipede doesn't bother with sneaky ambush tactics, it goes straight for the attack. But it's not super brave. If it gets hurt or freaked out enough, it'll bail on the hunt and skedaddle. In one intense scene, Cap's running through Skull Island's forests looking for his son when he runs into this massive critter. The centipede's all set to pounce, but Mike comes to the rescue, shooting it in the eyes with a flare gun. Blinded and freaked out, the centipede beats a hasty retreat. When it comes to fighting, this bug's got a couple of nasty pointed mandibles it uses to strike, and thanks to its gazillion and one legs, it's super quick, both in chasing down its prey and in making an escape when things get too hot. Psycho Vultures. In Kong, Skull Island, the Psycho Vultures swoop in and out of the story, giving the main characters quite a bit of trouble. These creatures don't play a major role, but their leafwing cousins sure do. At one point, Preston Packard takes one down with a sniper shot. Then there's the scene where a bunch of them gang up on Victor Neves, tearing him to shreds. They also accidentally help a skull crawler attack the humans in a boneyard. James Conrad even manages to slash a few with Hank Marlowe's katana. These Psycho Vultures are like the rulers of the sky on Skull Island. They've got this huge nine-foot wingspan and a special 
kite-like wing structure that lets them glide through the air super smoothly. They might seem blind, but they've actually got a kind of thermal vision to spot warm-blooded prey at night. They also use echolocation to get around, clicking the jaws and making guttural sounds. But this can attract other psycho vultures, so it's a bit risky. Now, here's the weird part. These guys are kinda crazy. They eat a toxic pufferfish from the island's waters, which makes them go berserk. This mania drives them to attack anything and everything, even their own kind. Despite having a small digestive system that suggests they should be eating plants and little critters, they're often seen dragging away prey way too big for them. For psycho vultures, it seems killing is more about the thrill than the meal. Siren Jaws The siren jaw on Skull Island is like a massive reptilian beast with a bit of a crocodile vibe. It's not just your average giant lizard though. This creature is covered in grass, roots and sometimes even trees growing on its back. It's got a huge set of sharp teeth and a pair of small orange eyes. When it's lounging half in the water, it can pass for a little island, which is a sneaky way to ambush unsuspecting prey. Now, when it comes to eating habits, siren jaws aren't picky. They're omnivores, but they really shine as ambush predators. There's this one time in Skull Island, the birth of Kong, where a siren jaw was about to attack some iwi folks and monarch agents, but it backed off when it heard Kong roar. Didn't help much though, since Kong took it down anyway. Generally, they act a lot like alligators and crocodiles, but they're not as social and tend to get lazier with age. Interestingly, some smaller animals actually live on mature siren jaws. These overgrown siren jaws are like moving islands with their greenery, and they help keep the little critters safe from other predators. The catch? Hmm. The animals have to be sneaky enough not to get eaten by the siren jaw or able to cling on tight when it rolls over. And while siren jaws do hunt Maya squids, the bigger, older squids can sometimes turn the tables on them. Death Jackals The Death Jackals from Skull Island, the birth of Kong, are a wild mix of mammal and reptile traits. They're part of the Canis subdivision, which seems like a typo of Canis, the real-world dog genus. These creatures are warm-blooded and have live births putting them closer to mammals on the family tree. Design-wise, the death jackals look like something out of a dino movie, resembling flesh-eating dromosaurs like velociraptors. They stand on two legs with a horizontal posture, forelimbs up in the air, and a long tail trailing behind. They've got no real neck to speak of and a big elongated head. Their skin is wrinkly and grey, decorated with bumps and yellow stripes. Around their head and on their exposed spine, they sport a mane of spiky, hair-like fibers, as sharp as razor wire, and their blood is white. Behaviorally, these guys are hardcore predators. They're so hungry, they'll eat each other, or even themselves, when food scarce. The monarch's profile on them suggests they're driven by a need to consume their own kind, painting them as extremely violent and hostile. They usually hunt in packs, which lets them take down big groups of prey. There's an interesting thing about the pregnant females. They're less aggressive, and after giving birth in secluded caves, they ditch their young. The death jackal pups often end up turning on each other, with usually just one making it out of the cave alive. Swamp Locust The swamp locusts on Skull Island are masters of camouflage, blending seamlessly into the swampy east side of the island. They're so good at hiding that it's tough to guess how many there are. These bugs stay under the swamp surface, stretching their wood-like limbs up through the water, making them look just like the surrounding plants. If all those stick-like things poking out of the water are swamp locusts, there could be thousands of them lurking, ready to snag any boat that comes too close with their plant-like claws. Trying to spot these creatures with submersibles is a real challenge. What we can make out, though, is pretty wild. The swamp locust is basically a giant throat and teeth. It's got a mouth like a lamprey, full of sharp, circular teeth that remind you of the Congo's Goliath tigerfish. But the craziest part it's got is just one long tube running straight through its body. Evolution's turned the swamp locust into a super simple, super effective predator, a living, hunting throat with some claws attached. Giant Lemurs In Godzilla Dominion, Godzilla reminisces about a blast from the past with two enormous lemurs. They're like the lemurs we know, particularly the ring-tailed kind, but on a monstrous scale. These giant lemurs have intimidating spikes all down their backs and sport scorpion-like stingers on their tails, not your average tree dwellers. Fun fact, the book's author, Greg Keyes, originally imagined these creatures as just big versions of the extinct giant lemur species, Archaeoindris bontoinanti. But due to a bit of a mix-up in communication, artist Drew Johnson ended up portraying them as full-blown giant monsters. Murderfish When Dr. Ishiro Serizawa used a nuke to bring Godzilla back to life, he unintentionally opened a doorway to the Hollow Earth. During Godzilla's visit to the temple ruins, he was swarmed by a bunch of strange aquatic creatures from down there. They moved together like one big coordinated group, 
Godzilla didn't do it though and torched a bunch of them with his atomic breath, but they just kept coming, including the big boss, the Genitor. Godzilla made quick work of it, ripping out its spine. With the leader gone, the rest of the swarm started feasting on its body, but Godzilla wasn't done. He burned them all to a crisp. These fish monsters are like something out of a prehistoric nightmare. They've got this eerie blue coloring, and instead of regular teeth, they sport a pair of sharp bony plates that come together like a beak. Plus, their eyes are a ghostly white. Definitely not your typical fish story. Murderfish Genitor in Godzilla Dominion Godzilla gets a nasty surprise from a hollow earth predator, the genitor of a swarm of fish monsters. This big baddie latches onto Godzilla's neck, but Godzilla's not having any of it and rips its spine out, ending it then and there. With the genitor gone, its swarm zeroes in on the carcass for a feast, but Godzilla quickly torches the lot of them. The genitor itself is a wild sight, much like a Dunkleosteus lookalike with a rough blue body. It's got pectoral fins with flashy red undersides, each boasting three fingers. The dorsal and pelvic fins are something else, sporting red ribbon-like flesh and its tail fin is more of that striking red ribbon flesh. The creature ditches traditional teeth for two pairs of sharp bony plates that form a beak-like mouth, and it's got these intense red eyes. In Greg Key's script for Godzilla Dominion, the genitor and its swarm didn't have specific names. Illustrator Drew Johnson started calling them murderfish as a bit of a joke, suggested by his editor. Keyes clarifies that they don't have an official name and genitor is just a term for the swarm's leader, kinda like the queen bee in a beehive. The rival. Back in the day, a younger and not-so-tough Godzilla got kicked out of his own pad by a member of Kong species. Fast forward a bit and the serpentine big shot, Titan Tiamat, rolls into Godzilla's old haunt and takes down the aging Kong. Fast forward again to 2021 and we've got a much tougher seasoned Godzilla. He comes back, ready to take back what's his, and makes Tiamat regret. In the process, he stumbles upon the Kong skull, a relic of that earlier battle. In Godzilla Dominion, they just call this monster the Rival, which was also the name used in the script. It's a bit of a throwback to Godzilla's past and a nod to his long-running beef with Kong's kind. Spirit Tiger. In the novelization of Kong Skull Island, James Conrad spots some intriguing animal tracks while trekking through the jungle. He figures they're from a big cat, estimating the creature to be several meters long, but that's as close as the group gets to seeing it on Skull Island. Then, in Kingdom Kong, things get wilder. A team of monarch soldiers on Skull Island comes face to face with a massive spirit tiger. This creature isn't messing around. It leaps at them, takes out a few soldiers, and nearly finishes the rest. That's until Kong steps in, grabbing the tiger by the neck. The spirit tiger doesn't go down easy, biting and clawing at Kong's hand, but Kong ends it by snapping its neck. These spirit tigers are like huge, ghostly white tigers with dark red-black stripes. Their eyes are a foggy white, and their most striking feature is a set of stag-like antlers. And like their smaller cousins, they've got sharp claws on all fours. Personality-wise, spirit tigers are the stuff of legend. Elusive, majestic, and kinda mystical. They're predators, usually going after smaller prey, but they're fearless and fierce fighters. When Kong grabbed one, it fought tooth and nail until the very end. They're described as some of the most elegant and mysterious creatures on Skull Island, but their exact role in the ecosystem is still a bit of a mystery. Baphomet. The name Baphomet, of course, has a wild history that's linked to the Knights Templar and mistaken for some devilish creature. Turns out it was a big misunderstanding, and Baphomet's name really got twisted from an old French word for the Prophet Muhammad. In Godzilla's world, Baphomet was living in Volubilis, Morocco, where Monarch had set up Outpost 68 just to keep an eye on it. Then comes Ghidorah, stirring up all the Titans with his call to arms. Baphomet, not one to miss out on the action, busts out of the outpost and joins the Titan hunting party. When it was time to rally the Titans to Boston, Baphomet is a no show and misses the whole showdown where Godzilla clinches the title of Alpha Titan. So while Godzilla's reigning supreme, Baphomet's MIA, not getting the memo in time. That's the lowdown on Baphomet's part in the Titan drama. Typhon. Tatana's Typhon, a daikaiju from Legendary Pictures, made a cameo appearance in the 2019 blockbuster Godzilla King of the Monsters. Although its presence was brief, primarily glimpsed on a monitor, it's still a massive monster. The name Typhon is rooted in Greek mythology, representing a monstrous serpentine giant renowned for his immense strength. This mythological figure, known as the father of Scylla, was considered one of the most powerful beings in Greek lore. Only Zeus, armed with his thunderbolts, could overpower this mighty creature. In the context of Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Tatana's Typhon's mention, albeit fleeting, ties the monsterverse to ancient myths, suggesting a world where legendary beasts from our stories might just be more real than we ever imagined. Triceratops. In Rebirth of Mothra 3, we're thrown back to the late Cretaceous, right into a classic dino drama. There's really little else of interest to talk about this one. So that was all in this video. If you've reached this point of the video, you truly are a fan of the universe. Pat yourself on the back.